David's saying we all agree, but that's not such a bad thing. Um, I think Francesca, look, who's our final respondent, will agree with a lot of this as well. Um, Francesca is a professor at the LSE and director of the Human Rights and Futures Project. Um, more importantly than that, she's one of the few leading academics who understands the left and the state Absolutely. and the relationship between yeah. the left yeah. and the state. And she knows that the state is the good thing when it provides sure start and it's a bad thing when it's the policeman spraying CS gas in the face of a UK uncut protester. Thank you very much, Francesca. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm going to shout. Um, this is a bit like speed dating, isn't it? <laughs> Not that I have ever speed dated. <laughs> so you started with an academic, and I'm afraid you're going to end with an academic, but don't go to sleep yet. Now, what I take most powerfully from your marvellous lecture, David, is a kind of counter-materialism. Despite your praise for Marx's prescience about our current predicament, a counter-materialism in the sense that we need to rescue a social vision of the public good from the stampeding herds let loose by voracious, untamed capitalism, as you brilliantly put it. But also a counter-materialism in this sense in the sense that there needs to be a realignment of the mind before there can be a true realignment of politics, I think is what you were saying. In other words, to reverse the famous Marxist maxim, the point is not simply to change the world, but imagine a better world first. How right you are, David, to say that there are so many giants to turn to to help us. I would add to your list Tom Paine, who actually understood that the rights of man, properly expressed, is not an excuse for rampant individualism, but actually a route to an ethical society. Weber, with his warnings about the dead weight of bureaucracy, and Orwell. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know what I would have done over the last 10, 13 years without George Orwell. And it's not <laughs> over yet, is it? I mean, it's still happening. We were told last week, curfews have been abolished. Curfews have been abolished? and replaced by overnight resident requirements. <laughs> I fear their ghosts would turn white if these giants came back today to see how little all their endeavours have helped us make progress, which is of course what progressives are meant to want to do, isn't it? Make progress. As Neil Lawson um, said in a recent blog, blog this very week, What's the point of politics if it doesn't put right the big things that are wrong in our world? And that brings me neatly to the big society versus the good society debate. Now, I listened, I don't know about you, but I happen to catch, I can't pretend I do every week, um, PMQs on Wednesday, Prime Minister's Questions, and I'm not schmoozing you, Ed, but you really socked it in this week. <laughs> <laughs> David Cameron was explaining what the big society is, and he said it involves three elements, as I heard it. Devolving power, localising public services, and encouraging volunteering and philanthropy. Now, I think, and I suspect most of you do, that this is absolutely fine. No quarrel at all as a means of enhancing participation and innovation. And there's no question in my mind that David Cameron struck a chord when he said before the election, there is such a thing as a society, it's not just the same, it's, not, it's just not the same as the state. For let's face it, by the time New Labour left office, they had managed the feat to, of uniting small state libertarians with social liberals and democratic socialists, not easy, in a cacophony of groans about micromanagement, central di diktats, and at New Labour's worst, worst authoritarian high-handedness. Never forget <coughs> freedom, never forget reform of the state. We heard it tonight, I'm going to hold you to that, Ed. <laughs> Anyway, what hit me when listening to David Cameron on Wednesday was not only the Orwellian nature of what he was saying as we watched big cuts shrink the network of community-based initiatives already flourishing, but that the big society, I realised, is fundamentally about means, not ends. It doesn't tell us much about our destination, does it? It te doesn't tell us what vision of the public good to use David's phrase, mm, mm, this mm, adds up mm, to. Mm. The good society, on the other hand, Neil, you'll be pleased to hear, in my view, is primarily about ends, about the kind of world we want to imagine. 
Now, many of us in this room, and I'm being very presumptuous here, may agree that a good society would be one where the dreams and optimism of youth are not crushed by middle-aged managerialism, where price competitiveness and productivity do not snuff out the ethos of public service and mutual concern, where caring and loving are valued as much as success and achievement, indeed they are seen as indicators of success and achievement, where pluralism and diversity and even downright eccentricity are respected whilst we build, yes, common bonds and share common values, yeah. and where standing for the many, not the few, does not become a byword for populism, in which focus groups trump universal human rights can't think what I'm alluding to there. Now, to achieve this good society, many of us who identify as progressives believe it must be more equal than now. And that state action must be aimed at unleashing people's potential for innovation and enterprise, not dull the human spirit with the dead weight of bureaucracy and central control. If democracy, as David was suggesting, is a key tool to reach this vision of a good society, or at least a better society, as you put it, perhaps a bit more realistic, then it has to be a democracy, as you said, that's more than head counting or a vote every five years. I think we all agree on that. But whilst we debate what local and participatory processes are necessary to achieve this, a new form of largely youth-driven networking and engaged democracy is opening up before our very yeah. eyes. One that appears immune to hermetically sealed ideologies and doesn't need formal structures to bring it to life. It's facilita facilitated by ever-expanding new technology, but it's not explained entirely by it. It's not focused on parties and leaders or elections, but on building a sustainable future. It's apparently now got a name, I've read, horizontalism. I have to say that had an altogether different <laughs> <laughs> But nevertheless, young people here in Europe, the Middle East, in fact, all over the world, are now doing it for themselves. It would be a shame to miss this phenomenon. Maybe this is the basis of your new movement, Ed. We're all horizontalists now. <laughs> I'm not taking it lying down, Francesca. <laughs> But we mustn't get too carried away. <laughs> Those of us who are old enough also remember the tyranny of structurelessness, that insight from 1970s <laughs> feminism. We understand that effective democracies, even do-it-yourself democracies, also need political leadership. So to conclude, what do we progressive need from our political leaders sitting here? We want them to reclaim what David calls the moral foundation of politics. We want our leaders to win elections, yes, to keep the economy on track, yes, we don't ask for much. But above all, we are crying out for ethical leadership. <coughs> ethical in substance, ethical in style, ethical in tone. And we don't just want our leaders to conjure up a better world, but we want us, them to inspire us to be our better selves. Ethical leadership combined with a new horizontal democracy now, that would be a realignment to blow the mind. <laughs>